Good morning, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for joining us this morning. We are good to go. There are still a few people streaming in, and um, but we want to keep on time. Uh, thank you. I'm Richard Rain. I'm the founder and managing director of iLearn. We have uh, over 100 people that have uh, registered to attend today, which includes some of our clients, our future clients, our facilitators, our staff, and, uh, and more importantly, those simply interested in learning about digital learning today. We are delighted to host you in uh, partnership with NetEx and our speaker in the UK, Mike Byrne, who you can see. Ireland has been at the forefront of providing a combination of CETA accredited qualifications and skills programs, non-accredited short courses and digital learning solutions for uh, 19 years to corporate South Africa. Never has there been a more of a requirement and demand to provide access to online learning experiences that only one month ago were considered a nice to have. Modern technology advances in recent times has broken down barriers to accessing costs and infrastructure requirements in providing learning easily and effectively in the cloud. Ireland is proud to represent NetEx in South Africa. We are considered a globally best of breed product and one of the leading innovation companies. Their platform provides companies with the ability to curate and distribute learning pathways and incentivizing learners using gamification and social learning tactics. We are fortunate to have Mike, who has been in this industry for various, uh, with various learning organizations for over 18 years. He's going to share with us his experience and global perspective so that we can apply the same here in line with our local requirements. Uh, please, during his presentation, feel free to send us any questions you may have, and uh, we'll get to them at the end. So, uh, without further ado, Mike, it's all yours. Perfect. Thanks, Richard. You can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay, right. I'm going to turn my camera off as well now. I just wanted to say hello to everybody so you could see me because I want to focus on the, on the presentation. So, let me just do that first and then we can get going. Um, okay. So, it's a real honor to, to be able to come and speak to you today and that so many of you have taken the time out of your day to, to join the webinar. At, at NetEx, we love working with iLearn and Richard and the team. They're so passionate about what they do. Um, and on a personal level as well, I also love South Africa. I, I was lucky enough to spend a week there in 2018 with iLearn, uh, meeting clients and speaking at events. And if you met me at that um, during that time in the summer of 2018, you'll also know I actually lived in South Africa for a while when I was a much younger man, when I was in 2001, uh, a long, long time ago now, I, I was lucky enough to play rugby uh, for a team called Neisner, as you all know, uh, in Southwest Districts. So it was a beautiful part of the world. So I've got, I've got a sort of a, a, a history with South Africa and it's a real pleasure to, to be talking to you today. I'm gonna take about 30 minutes um, because I want to leave in time for uh, questions at the end and to have a discussion. So as Richard said, there is a chat facility on the bottom right hand side in your tool menu. Submit your questions and we'll try and get through as many of those at the end of the session as we can. If we don't have time, we'll get a record of the questions and, and the team at iLearn can follow up offline. If there's one thing that I would like you to take away from today, it's really some clarity that we're all in this together. I mean, the use of the word unprecedented has become unprecedented. Every email I get now starts with, I hope you are safe and well. Um, so that's the reality of where we are now. We're living through a pandemic and we need to adjust to this new normal. I really like that phrase, a new normal. And, and, and adjust to the fact that life has changed. And probably for most of us, it's, it's, it will change in some way for, for good now. Um, and you'll all be from different industries within the webinar today. Some of you will be thriving. Some of you will be probably struggling at the moment as well. So what I want to do is talk about the role of L&D, specifically digital learning, and, and look at the role that we have to play going forward in connecting and engaging, not only with our employees, but also potentially with our customers as well. Because there's no doubt that L&D needs to pivot and adapt. Um, and it's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. Um, and this is, you can see the agenda on screen 
Um, this is what I'm going to go and, and, and look at today. Um, as Richard said, a bit about me, I've been in this sector for 18 years, so I've got an idea, I hope, about what I'm talking about. Um, and I've worked for a number of commercial operations for, sorry, in the commercial operation for digital learning organization. And it's given me, like I said, a good appreciation of potentially what's a fad, but also what works and what, what success stories we're seeing with our clients. At NetEx currently, I've got two hats. Uh, I manage NetEx's commercial operation in the UK. We're a, a Spanish headquartered company um, and I manage our direct operation in the UK but I also manage our global partner program of which I learn are a very important part. And you can see the rest of the 18 partners that we work with to distribute our solutions and distribute digital learning um, on the screen there now as well. Um, I think it's in talk, I, this isn't a marketing session about NetEx, but it's important for you to know a little bit about what we do and, and how it relates to some of the topics we're covering moving on. And what we're doing that may be different from the, the norm in terms of the, the vendor environment. Um, the big difference is that we talk solutions and not features. We have a, a learning ecosystem and, and the core component or application within there that you can see in the orange um, shape at the top there is Learning Cloud, which is our learning platform. Now, Lots of people previously have been talking about either learning management systems, LMSs, or LXPs. Actually, analysts in Europe are now saying that a lot of the LXP vendors are actually backfilling functionality from LMSs into their, into their platforms, and a lot of the LMS vendors are actually adding LXP-type functionality and features into the platform. So I think we're seeing a convergence of the market, which is slightly strange because LXPs have only been here for two years. But at NetEx, we've all, always talked about Learning Cloud as a, as a next generation learning platform. And that's a core component within our ecosystem. It allows us to deliver consumer grade learning experiences, to empower group discussion and, and empower subject matter experts to create content within the organization and also to thread coaching into the learning process. We also have a, a content creation and management app, Content Cloud, but the really exciting stuff is at the bottom here. We've integrated a business intelligence engine into the platform, Power BI from Microsoft, which allows us to align learning data with key business KPIs. And I'm gonna be talking about that much more later on. And the other thing we do uh, really interestingly is we've integrated Zapier. Take a look at Zapier, zapier.com. It's a business app integration service that allows us to integrate third-party business apps with NetEx Cloud really quickly and easily. Um, and what it allows us to do is ex to extend the capability and reach of the learning platform, for example, to also become an internal communication platform as well. If you want to integrate MailChimp to, to communicate with your internal audience or external audience, you can do that now as well. And then we and our partners as well wrap service around this platform. So I think for those of you that were new to NetEx, it's important just to, to be able to look at that. Um, one of the big themes for us in 2020, you can see the hashtag there at the bottom, Unlock LT20, Unlock Learning Technologies 20, is unlocking the knowledge that exists within the organization. We make it really simple and easy for you to empower subject matter experts within your organization to create and curate content. And we surveyed our, our audience base and the number one format for content in our platform globally at the moment is user generated video. And I'm gonna to be touching more on that later, but that's a really key thing in creating a very personalized and engaging learning program. And we also, we like to show off our awards as well. So there's some of the awards that we've got at the top of the screen. So, as we said in the synopsis of the webinar, um, I'm, I'm going to cover off on some areas. I'm going to look at some data. I'm going to review the changing world we live in. And then I'm going to look at items that you can take back to your organization today when you're thinking about your L&D strategy and L&D programs. Um, we ran, it's been a very busy week for me this week, actually. We had a webinar on Wednesday with a guy called Don Taylor. And maybe you can use the virtual raise your hand facility now um, to see if Don Donald's um, reach has extended into South Africa yet, yeah, but he's probably, well, he is one of the most eminent 
personalities within the learning technology field within um, within Europe. Um, and he he runs this thing called a Global Sentiment Survey, um, and it was our most popular. He wanted we we had him on to present the findings, and it was our most popular webinar ever with 260 people registered. Um, and the survey um, is a very simple survey. It's been going for seven years now. It's is sent out at the sort of just before Christmas and in January, and um, and now I think it's reached about 2,000 L&D professionals in 86 countries. Um, and I'd be interested to see in the comments if any of you in South Africa took place in this survey this year, took part in the survey. Sorry, and it asks one very very simple question: What will be hot in L&D this year? Um, now, not everything that is hot one year eventually takes off. But what it does give us a really good idea about is what people are thinking about in their organizations and what they're maybe looking at implementing in, in the year ahead. And I want to start looking at some of the data that came in from the survey this year. Um, and this is the top uh, 16 uh, responses in brackets for 2020. In brackets, you can see the 2019 results. I'm just going to take a quick sip of water um, where you can just take take a minute to, to sort of familiarize yourself with the results and also to see if this broadly speaking would have been a similar way that you would have voted for what you're seeing in, in South Africa and in your organization as well. So hopefully you've all had a chance to take a quick look at that now. Um, maybe some of you were picked of it up, up on this already the big thing is that data is absolutely dominating what people are thinking about in l d for 2020 so if we look at the top five we can see learning analytics we can see personalization and adapted delivery collaborative and social learning which isn't massive strictly data related but then we've got lxps and we've got artificial intelligence and i'm going to quote directly from don now so this isn't a mike Byrne quote this is a donald it's important to focus on that this doesn't necessarily mean that people know what they're talking about. It doesn't mean that they can use data properly. Um, and if it does happen, it doesn't mean that data will uh, data driven learning programs will happen for everyone. But interestingly, it does indicate an aspiration and a shift away from a from a content focused approach in learning and development departments across the world as well. People are really thinking about data and how they can use data to deliver much more effective learning programs. And that's what I'm gonna get onto when we come onto the section which looks about how we can learn from what marketing are doing when we're designing learning programs. Um, it's also interesting to track what Don, Donald calls the stable entries. And the two most stable entries over the last seven years are video and mobile delivery. And, and we're gonna focus on those two a little bit later on as well. But if you haven't, um, had a chance to look at the survey that I, I put the link in the bottom. We'll also send it out afterwards. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend you download the report and take a look at the results. Now, Donald also talked about COVID-19 and he had some really interesting insights to share. Um, and sorry, I had to mention COVID-19. I know it's on the top of all of our minds, but I want to look at now about the changing world and how the world has changed overnight and the effect that that's going to have on us as L and D professionals. Now, I am not a pessimist at all, but I, I also think it's important to have a reality check um, and and just to to get a sense of what's happening around the world. So my LinkedIn feed gives me a daily news rundown. And this, when I was started this presentation on Tuesday, I was very diligent this week. I started writing my presentation on Tuesday. Um, I just wanted to take away some of the key um, topics that were in the news feed. 140,000 UK firms have claimed wage help. So we've got this um, furlough scheme in the UK where the UK government will pay firms if they have to temporarily lay off workers. So there are more than 1 million people in the UK, that's probably risen now, that have been temporarily laid off by their by their businesses. Um, this one's interesting. I've, you know, I've got, we've got four children. And ordinarily when I do a webinar, I, <laughs> I get very focused on don't let the children make noise. But you know what? I just 
we, we're all getting on with it now. So if you can hear children in the background, please, please excuse them. But parents are burning out as a crisis drag. So parents working from home and teaching, maybe teetering towards burnout even before they can return to the office. I think this is important though. So we've got to realize, we I keep using this phrase, the new normal, this concept of a nine to five job, it's not, reality, it's not the reality at the moment. We're trying to juggle schooling children. We're trying to juggle other priorities and we work from home, maybe caring for people. So we need to recognize that as well. Um, if we move on, let me just see. Yeah, how bad will the recession be? Um, the world, the IMF, the International, International Monetary Fund is showing that the, the world will likely face its worst financial crash crisis since the Great Depression. And this last one made me laugh. So Richard Branson, the, the Virgin brand that you, hopefully you'll be aware of, he's had to offer his luxury Necker Island as collateral to secure a gov government bailout of Virgin Atlantic. Poor Richard. <laughs> but that gives you an idea of, of some of the challenges we're facing. And if we look at this now from more of a learning perspective, three months ago, um, when I was doing um, some trade talks at Learning Technology, which is the, the largest um, le uh, learning development show in Europe, in London, I was talking about the talent shortage. So I was talking about low unemployment, foc with a focus on reskilling internally and internal mobility of jobs and moving to new models of work. I'm not talking about that now. That's not the focus. That's not to say that's gone away. Um, and this fourth industrial re revolution is still looming in the, the skill shortage globally, but that's not necessarily the key focus for us now as L&D professionals. Um, this is some of the latest data from Josh Burson. This was released this week. Um, Josh has been important for the HR tech community in terms of raising our visibility within orga in the organization, but in also in providing a lot of interesting analytics and insights. And this, there's going to be a US focus to this because of his location, but this was a, the top issue on, the, on HR department's minds in the week of April, starting 7th of April uh, 2020. And the top four issues were health and well-being, managing this movement to a remote workforce, the continuity of work and retention of jobs, and the mental and, and trying to assist with, with mental health and the uncertainty within the workplace. So just take a minute to think about that and see if this resonates and replicates what you're seeing within your organizations. And this is how we've had to pivot overnight, but this is where L&D has got a huge role to play in how we can ensure that our people have the, the skills and the, the knowledge to be able to work remotely, that we are effectively managing or trying to manage the health and well-being of our, of our, um, our colleagues as well. And this is where we're having to pivot. And this is maybe where we're starting to address critical issues as well now. I use this slide quite a lot. And this is from um, a Deloitte Global Human Capital Trends Report. It's a little bit old now, 2017. But I, I think the, the content is still very applicable because I think it provides a great visual of the challenge that we face as HR professionals. And apologies if you've seen this before, but I think I want to take this a stage further now. We talk about this concept of digital transformation within our home lives, but also our working lives a lot. And this graph looks at just a chronological timeline across the bottom axis, but the rate of change across the, the vertical axis. And we can see that technology, and we know this, is technology is moving forward um, so quickly. And in our day-to-day -day lives as consumers, as individuals at home, we're able to embrace technological change uh, probably a little bit more easily. If we look at that from a business perspective and also from a public policy or governmental perspective, we are much slower to adapt to this, this digital transformation. And this is proving a huge challenge for us within organizations. And this is a really interesting slide from an Italian analyst called Fabrizio Bocci. And I'll, I'll provide the link to this this case study to the guys that I learned to share as well. Um, he's come up with this concept of what he calls a technological debt, which means the more, the longer we leave it, the more interest we accrue. And he's focused on the fact that as humans, we are resistant to change. Um, and he does not see a great level of reactivity or anxiety to understand the implications of change 
and to acquire these new skills that are required as we move forward towards this fourth industrial revolution as well. So there's, there's lots of talk about the need for continuous learning, but people really don't have a clear idea where to start and what path to take. And this is the ongoing challenge for HR. And I want to move on now to start to look at what we can do to, to address it. So the first area I'm going to look at in this fourth section is um, what we can do now with our, our digital learning and programs to adapt to this new normal. And the first thing is to, to adapt to um, um, this, what we call this thinking like a, a marketing department. And there's two key considerations for me here. The first thing is that we probably at the moment, we need to start thinking and acting more like an internal communications team. People are working remotely and, and more than ever, they need, they need leadership from the business and they need to remain connected and engaged. And the second key piece, and let's reflect back to what Donald Survey said, is data. Data absolutely changed everything for marketing when they started taking a, a more data-driven approach to designing their marketing campaigns. I was reading something about Facebook this week, about Facebook is tracking more, much more information than, than we would know or actually care for. Um, and you actually, you opt in, you have to actively opt out of this. It tracks everything you visit on your phone, down to the page, down to the clicks on the page. The results of this as a 40 year old guy is that I am bombarded with ads for hair loss and skincare products. And whether I like it or not, I've probably got a need for those. So this is, this data driven approach has actually transformed marketing's role. And marketing now is by many considered the most core department within an organization. And there was a study called Think with Google, run by Google, obviously. And I think I'm going to ask some honesty now. It's normally I ask for a show of hands if I'm doing this as a face to face piece, but maybe just think to yourselves. Who has tweeted something while I've been talking? Let me look at my I probably we've probably been going for about 20 minutes so far. Um, and if you have tweeted something, I hope it's something positive about me. Probably more likely than not, people have checked your mail during this 20 minutes that I've been talking. And some of you, hopefully not a massive majority, how many are on the call now? Let's see, there's about, uh, there's about 80 of us on the call now. Some of us have probably um, checked Facebook or what as well, but you're not going to, um, you're not going to own up from that. Well, from my perspective, the good news is that's not necessarily that I'm a less than engaging speaker. Hopefully that's right. It's actually, um, it's a physiology of the human brain now. So it's how we're wired up. And think with Google was an initiative that, that where Google were investigating the habits of, of how, cons how consumer habits, sorry, are changing. And it showed that our lives are no longer lived in years or days or hours. We live in the moment and we consume content when we need it, when we, when we have time for it and when we were in that moment. And if we look at that from a learning perspective, We've gone as human beings from a period of what was called deep attention, where we had a longer concentration span and we were able to concentrate on a single source of information. You remember the time where we delivered courses in eight hour chunks, relearning and training courses were five days. Um, we've now gone to this period that's called hyperattention, where we can manage multiple sources of simultaneous say start again multiple sources of simultaneous information and we have a low tolerance for boredom and this study showed for example that google obviously with youtube 67 percent of us have used a video to solve a productivity issue so globally we've become this audience of electricians and mechanics we're not trained in this but we know where to acquire this information and the, I always use the example of my kids um, when they were young at school, five years old, they came up to me and asked, Daddy, what's a split digraph? And I didn't know, but I knew how to find out. And that's where we're living in at the moment. So if we move on, um, let's just get the presentation to, to catch up. What we can learn from my marketing and, and, and I this was a diagram I've come up with and I and I like this because I think there's some really important um, parallels that we can focus on so the white smaller boxes here are, are um, what marketing is doing they're very focused on how they acquire customers so they're using data to acquire customers 
and to engage those customers so they create personal profiles and they know what content they're likely to interact with and they are trying therefore to increase the lifetime value of me as a consumer to the brand that they're marketing and they're also trying right at the fourth step to decrease churn so to retain these customers now if we look at this from a learning perspective in the blue boxes here the big first thing we need to do and this is key for me is l d needs to partner with the business we've moved on from that place where we are just building an elect a learning management system we're filling it full of generic content and there we go there's our learning and develop development strategy for the year we need to partner with the business we need to focus on projects we need to look at business issues and we need to look at how we can af positively affect those business issues with a learning campaign we then need to adopt a data-driven approach and I'm going to come on to this a bit more later on but we need to look at profiling our users we need to look at, at what content works best for which user base at what time it works best and we need to look at how we can collect and use that data we need to build a learning culture within the organization so it doesn't become a one-time event but we're delivering learning in the workflow of uh, learning in the workflow and it becomes a continuous learning environment and the last thing where we're moving towards and where i'm seeing some interesting um, changes within the industry is what i've called focus on the talent experience so look at how we can integrate our learning um, technology solutions with a broader hr technology ecosystem and maybe this new wave of talent experience platforms that are coming in and making the loop so identifying skills gaps and delivering relevant content based on the the talent needs within the organization as well so that's that's a very brief overview because we've got lots to go through but i think the more that we can start to think like marketing the the more we're going to be able to do and we also need to focus on data and I can't, and obviously Donald's um, survey results uh, reiterated this, but I, I, I can't say this enough. And this is gonna be quite a sweeping statement from me, but broadly speaking, broadly speaking, the learning world attracts people, people. So you probably have an interest in developing others rather than a scientific or an analytical background with an interest in systems and data. Um, so this in a sense has pushed learning professionals away from learning analytics but you've got to focus on it and i think as a commercial person within linkedin i'm quite a snoopy person anyway but if you start to check out people's linkedin profiles in your network you will start to see that more people are taking data analytics courses across the business specifically mainly from LinkedIn Learning where you can see the accreditation on the profile and more on that later as well but but take a look and it's definitely a new key skill set that learning and development professionals need to acquire um, and we're really focused in NetEx on measuring knowledge on behavior and then the the holy grail there at the end the business impact that this is having as well Okay, let's now move on to um, the content piece. And content's always been a critical component within learning. If you think of Apple Music or Spotify without music, it renders a platform useless. And the same can be said, obviously, of any learning platform. I used this screen before as well, because I really like this. This was the blight on our industry. This, this screen, this single screen, click next compliance course, this gave our industry a bad name. And, I, I like to use this dinner party story. Whenever I go um, to to social gatherings and very British, the first thing we do when we don't know someone is ask, well, what do you do? Um, and when I say I work in e-learning, there's always hands down two responses. The first is what's e-learning? So I think this is a problem. We, we recognize that we need to recognize that we work in a bit of a bubble. But the second piece is, um, oh, oh, second response, sorry, is oh, e-learning. Most people's um, experience with e-learning in an organization is, is a click next compliance course. And this is something that we need to move away from. And the game changer for this, in terms of how we redefining how we consume content is being YouTube. So if you thought cat videos were the big thing on YouTube, you're absolutely wrong. 
education and learning videos i think now i've got about five times the watch of animal videos that's over 500 million hours of learning videos watched globally every day and more than a million shares about 95 percent of millennials now have logged on to youtube to learn how to do something so content has become absolutely king or queen now so we've seen an upsurge in vloggers and production quality and storytelling we as consumers expect a certain quality of video content and we need to do that as well now within um within our learning and development programs we've got a great example of a, a customer using learning cloud that's doing this and it's evan cycles a retailer in the uk so they've created an internal studio they've um enlisted uh, an internal audience of subject matter experts so guys that work in the shops guys and girls that are uh, accessory experts or mountain bike or road bike experts or lights lighting experts they've given them the training to develop them into tv um personality and production skills and they've used them within this studio they've created internally to create really engaging and personal content and the data they're coming back getting back from the program is fantastic um, and this is a, a screenshot of learning cloud here and everything is mobile first as i said before our most popular content type is video and in fact that's actually user generated video because we give the ability for users to create interactive videos within the platform and i i was watching another thread on linkedin this week and people were talking l d people were talking about the phrase netflix for learning and they were getting a little bit sanctimonious and giving it quite a ne negative press mainly around this concept of the mass dumping of content which people associate with um with netflix but I thought they were kind of missing the point because Netflix was a game changer when it came to the user experience, the user experience in on-demand TV content. And that's what we're trying now to replicate with the learning platforms in the video. Also in the production of content, if you see some of these NetX documentaries, the, the Tiger King is going globally at the moment. Me and my wife are watching that. They've changed the game when it comes to production of content. And lastly, what they're able to deliver content online and offline. Um, and let's not kid ourselves, sometimes L&D doesn't have huge visibility in the business. So to talk about our solution as a, a Netflix type platform employee for employee development, I don't think that's too bad of an analogy. I didn't say anything on the LinkedIn thread, though, because I'm I'm too polite and I don't like arguing with people online. So but I'm telling it to you guys on the call now. Um, so to conclude with content. Um, the rise of video content and micro learning is relevant because it fits with people's profiles nowadays as we looked right at the start with the sync with google um, it allows us to focus on production quality and also be more agile so if we think of where we are now in this changing global landscape the ability to produce video content very quickly and engage with our audience is massively important as well and this was a screenshot from something we did with volvo focusing on new managers they were struggling with completion rates in the traditional course methodology and they needed to re-engage with learners so we designed it we accredited it and we really focused on the production quality of the video it was a real um, real success um, and the last one i want to look at before summarizing so i know we're, we're sort of running out of time before we get to questions is gamification um, now gamification was big three years ago and it's it's still being used by a lot of our customers, but it's not been at the forefront front, sorry, of people's mind. But I really think there's an opportunity for gamification now. Um, and I want to tell you why. Uh, it's a little bit of self-indulgence here, so please forgive me. Since we've moved or started moving towards the lockdown and the, the associated health issues with COVID-19, I've decided I wanted to get fitter. I, I sort of let my fitness go a little bit. Um, that's an understatement. So I started running and I started using Strava. Hopefully some of you will be aware of Strava. It's a, a great app that the global fitness community use. Now, what I really like Strava is because of the gamification pieces. So I created myself goals, a weekly distance challenge and an annual distance challenge. I also signed myself up to challenges to be awarded badges. So in April, I signed myself up for an eight, a 10K and also in a half marathon, 21K, which I did this week, which I was really proud about. 
And I also look to better my achievements, so personal best over time and distance. And I've supplemented this with a discussion group of my friends in WhatsApp where we motivate each other and we talk about what we've done. And I really did this half marathon because three of my friends did and I didn't want to be the only guy that did it. And it's been a, Strava's been a really positive experience for me. And if we look at gamification more generally, I'm running out of time now, so I'm just going to pick out one of these. Some of you will remember there was a famous picture about when they transformed an a uh, set of stairs in a New York subway into a working piano because too many people were using the elevator. No one, no one was using the stairs in, in New York subway systems. Um, and by transforming it into a, a piano, the steps that people could engage with, they increased its usage by 66%, which is a, a fantastic stat. Um, and I mentioned game, I've mentioned engagement a couple of times so far. Engagement is key as we move to this new remote, remote working environment. We've got to look at, because engagement is a, a, a factor that affects things like productivity, absenteeism, profitability. And gamification and learning is just a, a small part of that. But it, I think it now will be leading to more engaged employees. And where we're seeing it now as a real key um, structural mechanism in our customers' learning programs are that in customers that are delivering sales training internally, clients that are using Learning Cloud to deliver onboarding and also product training internally and technical training. And the last one, which is a big growth area, we always talk about internal training, but delivering certification-based training to your customer base as well. There's a fantastic opportunity to use badges. I talked about earlier about people showing their LinkedIn learning badges on the profile maybe showing you are certified in a product as well. There's a, there's a huge opportunity there. Okay, so to summarize here, this is a, a, an example of something that we were doing with a, one of our larger clients globally. I can't name the client, but they are one of the world's largest online retailers. And lots of platform vendors out there are talking about AI at the moment. And in fact, earlier this week, I was giving a, a tour of one of the first fastest um, growing AI driven talent experience platforms that matches um, people to internal role, roles within an organization. And in actual fact, I came away from it thinking this is just tagging. They're tagging people's interest and they're tagging roles as they upload them and then they're making the match. So I would be very careful when vendors are talking about AI. Um, I think that's a longer road that we're, we're walking down. But what we're doing with Learning Cloud is that we are assessing what people know, we're looking at what skills they have and we're reviewing what they can do because we're integrating Talent Cloud as well now, a, th a third application within the ecosystem to deliver an adaptive and personalized learning experience. And then we're blending that learning experience right. I've mentioned video lots, but we're looking at things like classroom, curated content resources, and the metric, and we're measuring that with Power BI, which we've, in we've integrated to create this continual learning group. And this company are actually using the learning data. They're making a correlation between key business KPIs and the performance of what they're doing as a, an online retailer. And they're also using the data from the system to address short-term um, resourcing gaps in terms of roles based on um, skills and knowledge within their management community as well. So it's a really exciting program. Um, Last slide for me then, before we open up to questions. I think the important thing at the moment is don't expect too much of people. Um, we're in this emergency mode at the moment. I mean, two days ago, I spent six hours on video meetings and it was exhausting. So don't think, please, that everything has to be a video conference at the moment. I would say that um, look at what you can do now, but also start to look to plan for what the new normal would be uh, in the future. Um, and don't be afraid to test and fail, but make sure you have the data set to, to analyze. And lastly, most importantly for me, look at campaigns, start with the business problem, look at how you can impact it, look at the, the, what you can measure and work back from there. Um, and don't necessarily all, always go for this one size fits all approach for learning. Um, but Richard, uh, that's it, I think, from me at the moment. Now, I think we should... Hopefully, happy to get some feedback from the audience and see if we've got any questions that come in. 
Mike, thank you. It looks to you like you did such a fabulous job that people were so engrossed that they actually didn't ask any questions. We only got compliments actually so far. So well done and thank okay. you. But uh, I, maybe I can kickstart um, a little bit of the discussion. Um, I think what would be interesting to know, you know, given what you've said and the, the um, you know, feedback from the survey is, you know, how, have you heard any uh, any great stories over this time? I know it's only been a, been a month that um, companies have been in lockdown and remote uh, working. Um, you know, based on that Josh Burston survey, it sounds like people are mostly in panic mode and trying to maintain employee well-being and productivity. Where's learning f fitted into that? Like, have you seen any great stories of how uh, there's been maybe a turbo boost? in digital learning and interest and how it's how it's helped people yeah i think the big thing is i think there's definitely areas where learning can help straight away um putting resources around around how to work from home more effectively because for a lot of people this is a, a completely new situation so creating resources that are specific for the company that they can make available as i said before what we've seen is people try and fail with bombarding people with online synchronous sessions. We can get tired of that quite quickly. And we also, as I've mentioned, the reality is that people are trying to figure out how to balance working from home and school and kids and all of that type of stuff. So don't try and do too much. Um, we're getting success stories where people are putting self-directed learning and resources available um, to make aware of where as well. But I think that it's, it's early days still, um, Richard. A lot of companies are still testing out what's working. Um, and I think, as I said before, just recognize that we're almost in this emergency state at the moment, but life is probably going to change moving forward. And now is the time to start planning about what your digital learning um, strategy might be moving forward over the, the, the next year and beyond as well. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. You know, um, in fact, we are luckily uh, our lockdown and its restrictions are going to start to ease from uh, Thursday next week. And so I think in the next week, it'll be a great opportunity for people to start thinking about beyond the here and now. And I think that's where uh, digital learning um, is, the, is the key uh, thing to think about over this time and thinking about the next year where the, you know, the access to people are still gonna be restricted and the ability to bring people together in uh, you know, small uh, learning conference facilities um, is gonna be a problem. So, so yeah, I, I like the idea of, um, of providing a blended learning delivery, part online, part instructor led or over virtual learning. And, uh, and I suppose it's platforms like Netix's Learning Cloud that, uh, that facilitates that. So I think what's um, you know what's what's I think important to the message I want to get across here is that it's the platform that can drive the ability to step into this digital learning world. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think we've had a question coming, or we having I have a couple of questions now, which is great. People just ah, taking their time yes. to warm up. Okay, um, great. So let's start with the first one from uh, from Mandy. Uh, so the question is, how do we how do we deal with a barrier of access to internet learning in developing countries in South Africa? It's a great question and a really real barrier to entry here. Yeah, that's a good challenge. So I think um, there's a couple of things that you can do. One is you can look at solutions which allow you to download resources offline and access them within when you have, sorry, download them when you're on and then access them offline when you might not have the connection or want to pay for the connection. Um, and with XAPI as a technology, you're now able to do that and still track what learners are doing. The second thing is, if that is going to be a challenge, um, just think about it into your learning design. Not everything, I mean, I know I've talked about video a lot and it's a great resource but look at maybe the bitrate of the video you're creating. Um, we, we're definitely doing it at NetX with some of our global customers. We can adjust bitrate based on connection speed and quality. Um, and also, if it doesn't always have to be video, um, look at maybe resources that you can make available um, if people are, are working um, uh, remotely as well. Yeah, I think there's a huge consideration for, for then content. You've got to be able to possibly lean more towards 
uh, t uh, text and, and low resolution graphics as opposed to um, you know high, high uh, rich video uh, and learning content but I also believe that that should become less of a barrier to entry and we're looking at new um, te telecommunications companies uh, one in particular that's called funny enough rain and uh, they offer a uh, unlimited uh, 4G um, uh, account for only 250 rand a month, <clears throat> which I think to a large extent really completely obliterates that barrier to entry. So I think companies are going to weigh up what's more important, the ability to give access or a small cost of providing that data. All right, we've got another question. All right, so our next question is from uh, Pella. And um, <clears throat> they say, I work in a company that is e-learning, but it's not used, but it's not used it effectively. And I want to show them what can be done with e-learning. How do I start my marketing strategy to show the benefits or the resourcefulness of a digital platform? Great question. Yeah, good question. So it all comes back to this data piece. Um, and I think that uh, experience is probably something that's been replicated by a number of organizations globally and especially clients that we're working with and it probably goes back to what I was saying in terms of having a one-size-fits-all build it and they will come mentality with the LMS it hasn't necessarily always worked so what I would try and do uh, fella is identify as I've said critical business issues don't try and do everything at once maybe look at specific project-based pieces. So maybe it's uh, onboarding or maybe it's how you're working with the sales team or whatever. Look at how you can develop a program that you can measure effectively and you can prove return on investment to the business because this is key for CEOs. And also what we can do after this call with iLearn is put some resources together to show you in terms of case studies um, uh, of what other clients are doing that's successful as well. So we could, we're happy to help with that. Superb, thank you. All right, we've got another interesting question, uh, which is probably a more of a macro question, which is uh, how are clients responding to digital learning? Are they positive about it and on board with the idea? Maybe you can talk about your experience and sort of the upward trajectory trend of interest in digital learning over the years. Yeah, I think, as I, as, as I said, I mean, there was a real problem in the industry um, because the industry was dominated by compliance content that, you just clicked and clicked and clicked and got through the course as quickly as you can and kept doing the assessment at the end until you got 80 percent and then you could forget about it for a year so i think um the real game changer has been around the user experience both at a platform level and at a content level and the ability now where we are to start creating much more personalized learning experiences as well um, so that's where we're seeing our clients really have a better uptake. Um, and I think you've also got to be aware, I mean, some people do crave that human interaction. So it's digital learning isn't going to work for everything for everybody all the time. It's got about, as Richard said, hopefully we're not going to be in this situation forever, even though I do feel that the working environments are going to change. But recognise that's about getting the blend right um, and making sure that we're getting that that human interaction still as a core component of any learning program. Just to uh, dovetail that, I mean, just to give you so our experiences, I learned, I mean, we've been in business for 19 years and uh, we only started offering digital learning uh, in 2011. And I, I would have to say that uh, with uh, more access uh, to internet and lower data costs over the years, has definitely been been an, been an interest. I would say up until that point, and probably more more recently, um, the e-learning was pro perhaps limited to mostly enterprise level size clients. They had big uh, big learning budgets and had large distributed uh, workforces, where uh, it was easy to justify uh, not sending a team of trainers to fly around the country and all the expenses that come with that. So we're seeing in the mid-sector uh, size client base a dramatic increase in interest in digital learning. And to be honest with you, the lockdown and, and this whole experience has just absolutely catapulted um, the interest um, to still provide learning to staff that are, that are working remotely. 
So I'm, I'm very encouraged by um, the, the, the recent increase in demand and, uh, and the mm -hmm. ability to widely deliver a uniform learning experience um, across multiple geographies. All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, we've got one here from uh, Tisha, which is, uh, do you think organizations should continue with the working remotely designed models, even though the regulations are being relaxed? Well, I think that's more a governmental policy question, so not necessarily one for me. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, all I would say is uh, from discussions I'm having with colleagues and clients and customers, um, and I've talked about this a couple of times, but we think there will be a new normal, um, that um, we're going to get past this pandemic, but people will be used to working from home. People will expect it a little bit more. Companies will be maybe looking to make real estate cost savings as well. So, um, yeah, yeah I mean, so. I'm not going to get involved in the political side of it, but I, I definitely think the work, work, the working life will change for people. And I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. I mean, you said earlier you've been, uh, you know, spent a whole week, uh, all day, every day, every hour on calls. You know, the time that we ordinarily would, uh, uh, we would spend uh, commuting to the office, uh, the in-between water cooler chats, and the, what we call sort of the downtime um, is, not, uh, is, not, is, is not happening at the moment. So, uh, no, so I, I wonder, yeah, yeah, I wonder calls, like, the levels of productivity. Yeah, and video calls are tiring, Richard. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, oh. it's, it's, it's a different concentration style. So, um, so yeah, we, yes. it's, yeah, it's about getting the right blend and it's going to be relevant, specific to which industry you're in. But I think, yeah, we'll have to wait and see with that one. Yeah. All right, let's see. We have one more question here from Derek, which is, um, as an L&D professional, how can we motivate practitioners to embrace digital learning, especially in South Africa? Um, I think it starts by maybe focusing on some of the areas I talked about today, because I know for a lot of organizations, we're going to have to try and instigate a mindset change because of the inherent issues that were associated with learning previously. So we've got to start talking about success stories. We've got to start talking about things like data-driven learning. We've got to start making these um, analogies and parallels with marketing to really try and raise the profile of, of, of digital learning within an organization. And, and that's, as I've, hopefully it's sort of, um, I'm reiterating the point, but start with the business problem. Don't just build digital learning because you have to. Start with the, digit, the, the business problem that you're trying to solve. Look at how you can measure how you're solving it and then work back from there. And, um, and then, I mean, I've used slides before. What CEOs really want from learning programs is return on investment. They want to see that this is having a positive business impact. And now we can do that because of some of the ways that we can track and analyze the data. I think there's a fantastic opportunity. Yeah, very much. And I think the other point is to maybe start small and not uh, necessarily a big bang approach uh, to try and get all your learning that was previously face to face now all of a sudden be delivered online. And I like the idea of taking one particular element like onboarding, for example, for new employees that as they come into the organization uh, as a, you know, sort of, uh, as a modern uh, workforce providing modern learning experiences. What an unbelievable way to set the tone for a new employee to come on board to receive learning, you know, in, in that way. And then the other thing in terms of our experience is that, um, you know, I think, uh, like I think you mentioned it earlier, you know, depending on the contents, the curriculum, what determines a suitable uh, uh, curriculum that's delivered digital. There's just some curriculums that just are not suitable mm -hmm. for digital learning. I think that's also yeah, really important. Absolutely. And I can see a question from Megan around that as well. And I'd agree. I mean, as I said during the presentation, I mean, I was focused at the start of, year, of the year talking about the upcoming skills shortage globally, looking at how job roles are changing. A lot of roles are becoming automated, but there's still a mat. There's going to be a massive focus on skills like critical thinking and management um, skills and creativity. And you're right, not all of that can be delivered in an online course. We learn that from our experiences. We learn that from interacting with other people. So yeah, it's about getting that, that blend right. Yeah, beautiful. All right, I think we've got time for, uh, for one more question. I'm uh, cognizant of, uh, of finishing on time. 
so the next one is, um, I don't know if we touched on it earlier, but uh, you know, what, what's a good strategy to transition from uh, in-person training to online learning? And um, you know, you know, maybe what's the strategy around that? Like, have you got like a step-by-step -step idea? On yeah, I think there's a there's a lot of um, content being produced around this about how to how to sort of uh, transition to a virtual learning environment. I think the first thing I say is at the moment probably don't try and do too much, as I've said, um, and and recognise that with a sort of with any any change process there are uh, stages of change so um, don't try and um, take everything that you did in a classroom or face-to-face -face setting and, and digitize it because that's going to be an overload on people and that's that's not going to work I think a lot of people are finding um, and also recognize that tools like go to webinar like zoom they are they are great, but they are tools. They are not. They are not learning all the way, all the time. They're broadcast. They're communication tools. So also, you need to make the differentiate differentiation. For example, NetEx now we're we're working a lot of our developer resources on creating this new feature called Spaces within the platform, where we can deliver blended learning programs. We're using smart content. We're using algorithms now to start to measure things like students' level of motivation and confidence so we are we are not just blindly broadcasting to people but we're actually measuring how they're interacting in a virtual um session as well so um so yeah it, it's don't try and do too much too quickly um focus like you said richard on on smaller projects uh, yeah and don't feel that you have to have to digitize everything because we'll all go crazy if we do that yeah yeah absolutely all right, cool. I think that's uh, all we've got time for. And uh, yeah, Mike, just thanks, thanks again for making the time and for uh, really giving us such amazing insight. We've had an amazing turnout uh, that joined us today. And uh, yeah, for those that didn't make it, obviously we will uh, send send the recording. Um, but uh, but yeah, if anybody's interested in learning how to transition to a digital learning world and you need our help, please get in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to have a discussion with you and uh, and explore those possibilities. So yeah, uh, you're welcome. You yeah, you're welcome, Richard. Thank you for thank you for inviting me. Um, there are more questions coming through. We can collate them afterwards and answer them offline as well. So if we didn't get to answer your question, don't worry. Um, but yeah, have a great rest yeah. of your Friday, everybody. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.